This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the League of Women Voters of Hamden North Haven's annual conversation with legislators held remotely today for the second time. I am Judy Lehman, member of the steering committee of the Hamden North Haven League of Women Voters. Thank you to the three senators, Jorge Cabrera, Paul Ciccarella, and Martin Looney, who are joining us today and to representatives Mike D'Agostino, Jock, Josh Elliott, Liz Linehan, Mary Wielander, and Dave Yaccarino for being with us as well. And thanks to all of you for being here and to those who submitted questions in advance. We will get to as many submitted questions as possible today. Our experienced moderator today is Jean Rabinow. Jean is an attorney in private practice and is a member of the steering committee at the League of Women Voters of the Bridgeport area. She was employed as Chief Administrative Officer of the League of Women Voters of Connecticut for 17 years um, prior to um, giving up that job to become um, one of Trumbull's two registrars of voters in 2020. Um, Jean, over to you. Thank you. The rules today are very simple. Each legislator on the panel will have up to two minutes to respond to each question. Uh, we'll ask the questions in turn, starting with a different legislator each time. Uh, there will not be opening statements as such. Um, and the first question to all the panelists, starting with Senator Cabrera is, <laughs> The November 2022 election resulted in passage of a ballot measure authorizing the General Assembly to enact legislation amending the state constitution to allow for early voting. What provisions do you think are important to include in the legislation and specifically, how do you feel the process of early voting should be implemented in Connecticut? What locations, what hours, and should state funding be appropriated to support the process. Senator Cabrera. Thank you, Jean. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to the League for having us and gathering us this Saturday morning. Yeah, that was a, a really important piece of legislation that I supported and voted for. It. And I think there's nothing more important, uh, particularly at this time in our country's history, than to make voting easier and more accessible to more people in our state. Uh, I am very much in favor of extending as much time as possible. I know we're going to be having a debate in the legislature about how much time. One thing that is clear to me is that families are busy. Uh, moms and dads are, are busy with children, with work, with chores, and we need to make it as accessible as possible for people to vote. For me, that means we need some weekends. And I'm hoping that as the legislation makes its way through the legislative process, that we have a Saturday or a Sunday or both for folks to make time to come vote. I think we should have as much time as possible. I think the state should um, fund to better train uh, our clerks and our local officials to make sure that we have as smooth a process as possible. Uh, this is new uh, for us. It's not new for most of the country. Um, and so uh, I'm excited about what this is gonna look like, but I think we need to keep our eyes on expended times and days and making sure that folks at the local level are fully equipped and feel supported in order to pull this off. And I think we will. Thank you, Senator Ciccarella. Thank you, Jean. And again, thanks for putting this together uh, on a nice Saturday afternoon. Soon, hopefully we could gather in person. Um, um, I think it's important that everyone has access to vote um, and we make it convenient as possible. Um, while doing so, um, I want to make sure that there's security in place um, to make sure that the town halls have the resources they need um, without mandating um, additional hours on them. 
Um, I've, I've heard from numerous town halls within my district that they would be concerned um, to how they're going to get this done when they're having challenges handling their workload now. Um, but I think we have to work to find a way to have that balance so everyone has the access to vote um, and do so conveniently and safely um, and just really want to make sure when we're helping come up with those uh, systems um, that we just focus on on security um, and making yeah, sure that <laughs> Dave's hopping in there. Um, but but that's that's right about where where um, um, I was about to end. So maybe uh, Dave will pick up. Um, Senator Looney. Yes, I, I'm pleased that the voters uh, approved that constitutional amendment and gave us the authority to. Uh, uh, enact a statute to provide for early voting. And there are three uh, questions that have to be answered in that. First, uh, how far in advance of election day will we begin early voting? Uh, secondly, how many early voting days <clears throat> there will be during that period? And third, uh, what the hours of early voting will be um, and how many polling places in each community will be required uh, to be open for early voting and what's the, uh, the ratio that we use in terms of uh, uh, how many per community based upon population. So these are all important questions uh, that uh, uh, will have to be dealt with legislatively. Uh, unfortunately, uh, unlike most other states, until the Constitutional uh -huh. Amendment passed, we were not in a position to legislate because so many of our uh, voting provisions are actually in the Constitution rather than uh, open to statutory change. So now that the, the voters have empowered us to do that, uh, we will be uh, taking input on all of those issues on implementation. Uh, Representative Agostino. Good morning. Thanks. Uh, thanks again for hosting this. I uh, always appreciate uh, coming. Um, I, I I like the idea of at least two weeks of early voting. I think that makes sense. I think once you get past that, as much as I would like this maybe a little longer time, keep in mind the, um, the issue in Connecticut is we don't have a professionalized um, uh, registrar voter system, right? We've got 160 plus different registrars for every town. Uh, it's very local. Uh, my dog is making an appearance, sorry. Um, and, and that's that's always the struggle with Connecticut on a lot of things. And that's what I fear is going to, um, uh, at least initially, maybe hold us back from a more robust early voting system than I'd like to see. Uh, you asked the question about funding. I think it's going to be important to have funding go along with this because I think there's going to be a number of local registrars who are going to perhaps be a bit overwhelmed by the process. We're going to be, just by nature, the nature of the beast, all the local registrars asking them to do a lot. So we've got to make sure we give them the resources if we're really going to have uh, early voting. I, you know, eventually I'd like to see a more professionalized, less politicized registrar voters. It's, it's, a, it's an elected position sometimes in some towns, it's still a patronage position, which doesn't necessarily mean it's the most qualified person, um, but rather who knows who. Um, uh, so I, I'd like to see a professionalized registrar system, but that's but that's down the road. But I think if you had that, you'd be able to do a more robust early voting system. Okay, uh, Representative Elliott. So a lot of my statewide race for Secretary of the State was premised on the length of time we would have to vote. And I uh, was out early with two to three weeks. <clears throat> and uh, during that race, I, I was definitely seen as the person who is pushing this the farthest and the hardest. And now uh, two weeks has become normal. And it looks like the GAE, the Government Administration and uh, Election uh, Committee will be looking at two weeks seriously. Uh, Secretary of the State's office uh, is now looking at two weeks seriously. And I think uh, the majority of my colleagues are are looking at, at two weeks seriously as well. So that's really exciting <clears throat> to jump on to Representative D'Agostino's point. When I was in Colorado a couple of years ago, they showed me a, a graph of what it looks like for early voting and the number of people that come out. And it basically looks like this. And then all of a sudden it goes like this the last few days before the election. So um, while it is great to have more opportunity for more people as early as possible, uh, the fact is that even when that opportunity is available, the vast majority of people still don't take advantage of it. Doesn't mean that it shouldn't be uh, possible and available for people, um, but recognizing that just going farther and farther out does not necessarily make it easier for people because people uh, aren't actually gonna be um, using it. 
I, I know that the Georgia Secretary of the State was just recently in Connecticut and made some comments that they used to have, I think, 45 days of early voting there, and they, they have since brought it down to 17, I want to say. So uh, we are in no way going to be an outlier with two weeks, if that is the number that we uh, end up using. And uh, two full weekends is gonna be great. And uh, I do think that we do need to provide as many resources from the state to these localities as possible uh, to offset the additional burden. And uh, we'll see where this goes, but I'm, I'm excited that uh, it looks like this is going in the right direction. Representative Linehan. Hi, thank you so much. It's really good to be here. Um, I, you know, it's kind of difficult bringing up new ideas when you have all of your fantastic colleagues giving some information beforehand. Um, but, you know, and I, I agree with uh, the two weeks. I think that that's important. But one thing that actually really hasn't been mentioned that is important to me is that the hours and the days uh, are not just weekdays and it's not just during work hours. And I think that those need to be, um, we need to have at, within those two weeks, um, at least one, I prefer two weekend days. Uh, and regarding the cost, I think that we can lessen um, the hours on a certain weekday in order to bring in the weekends. The idea of early voting was really to ensure that people with jobs that can't necessarily take time off uh, would have a voice at the ballot box. And so I think it's important to note that not everyone lives a nine to five. Uh, and, and that is something that is really, really important to me. So thank you. Yeah. Representative Linehan. I'm oh, sorry, Representative Willander. Good morning and thank you. Um, I, I There's really not too much more I can add to these conversations. Again, we're looking at making sure that uh, people who want to vote have the option, that there aren't those barriers in place. Um, I agree with uh, what Representative Linehan just said about ensuring that we have weekend hours. I think that we can offset costs by operating for the most part during uh, normal business hours that the registrar might um, uh, hold normally in, in the town halls um, and looking at creative scheduling to make sure that we're not putting undue burdens on the registrars who are also people who have families and lives and have other obligations. So it will require, um, a, I think, robust conversations within the legislature. And uh, I look forward to having it. But again, I think anything we can do to make voting more easy and more accessible um, and easier for people are is the right step to take. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Jacarino. Good morning and uh, good to see everybody. Uh, sorry, I'm a little late. I'm I'm, I'm actually at work right now. Uh, early voting. Um, well, back to Representative Lanehan's point of nine to five. You currently work nine to five. You could get a, an absentee ballot and to vote. So that's not a there's no restriction there. Fortunately, and thank goodness. I think we should l listen to the registers and the town clerks, are both Democrat and Republican. Um, I don't have a. I personally would rather see, in obviously your in person um, early voting three to five days max, but with your photo ID, right, with the extended hours in the town hall. But I think we really need to listen to our, our registers and our, our clerks, and we need to fund it as a, if we, you know, we need to fund the town. Right? This is a huge burden for them. And it's not a bad burden, it's a good burden, but we need to fund it. I put a bill in a number of times the past Secretary of State was against it <clears throat> um, for the election day to be a holiday, state holiday. And it was pushed down. Governor Lamont loved the idea, <clears throat> but the former secretary, uh, didn't like it, and I, I haven't gone forward with it because it's just going to be a battle between different days off. But I really think that should be there. Everybody should take off and, and have a, a holiday. So uh, we want it full access to everybody to vote. It's an amazing right. It's, it's probably one of our greatest rights. And to, to uh, but to do it, do it where it's going to work. And I think Connecticut's done a pretty good job overall. The three to five days, it, it would be great. That's my view. If you want two two weeks, we're going to have to have the, the, that debate. But I would prefer the three to five days with your ID. I don't know why we can't just show, show a photo ID. You can do it for pretty much everyone else. And if people can't afford one, well, we would obviously we could allocate that. That's fine. And thank you for having us, by the way. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Um, there's no rebuttal as such on this. So we're going to the next question. And this one, we're going to start with Representative Chicarella. It's on housing. Connecticut has insufficient affordable housing. Do you feel that working on this problem should be a legislative priority this session? 
And if so, what legislative actions on housing would you like to see put into place this year? Thank you. Um, I had the privilege of being a ranking member on housing my, my first um, my first time around. And we realize that that is a huge issue. Um, we need housing. Housing is the first step uh, of growth. It's going to allow people to come here, work, and grow our economy. And we realize that there is a shortage. Um, I do think there are some really good plans that are in place. Um, we are focusing on the transportation hubs and developing um, affordable housing in that area. I think it's a great idea. Um, I'm also on the Future Caucus. And one of the um, topics that we are discussing and, and concerned about is affordable housing for young families to come here and, and um, grow their family. And there are a lot of old buildings that are not being utilized. And some builders are taking advantage. Um, maybe it's the cost of, of material that decided um, to push them in that direction, but they're, they're buying these older buildings and redeveloping them. Um, and it, it's a great model. And I think we need to be very creative to find more housing here um, in Connecticut. Uh, Electric Boat um, is saying over the next, I think it was three to five years that 30,000 people are gonna be coming in to work there, um, a combination of the growth and retirement. Um, and I know that the governor's workforce council is also very much focused on um, um, housing for our workforce. And I think we need to continue to find creative ways to solve the problem that we have here in Connecticut. Senator Looney? Yeah, so I'm, I'm pleased that the governor uh, proposed a, an affordable housing initiative in his proposed budget. We certainly need more uh, housing, not only uh, for uh, lower income uh, families, but also for in the middle income range in order to uh, uh, find a way to make our workforce more robust. We hear all the time from employers who have job uh, uh, openings to offer and find out they can't find people to fill them because of a housing problem and <clears throat> just being priced out of the market, both for rental and for uh, and for purchase. So we clearly have to uh, to deal with that. We need to find ways to uh, to grow our population, both in our cities and also in, in areas where. Uh, where, where workforce opportunities are being created. So I think we need to operate on all fronts. I was pleased to hear Senator Ciccarella mention uh, transit-oriented development. I think that's going to be critically important uh, wherever there is a uh, train station or a bus depot in Connecticut. Uh, we ought to change the, the the zoning rules in that area within a certain radius around it to provide for greater density of housing uh, to make that a way of sort of the entry point for uh, more lower cost, uh, greater density housing. Uh, we also have to be prepared, I think, at the state level uh, to uh, help municipalities who are willing to invest in affordable housing because often they don't have the infrastructure to support it. Uh, many towns give the reason that, well, we can't have any more housing than we have uh, because uh, everyone has wells. We have no infrastructure, no water system. So uh, if the state really wants to make a, a commitment to a broad-based change, it's gonna have to be a partner uh, with the municipalities in helping to fund the changes that need to be made uh, in order to promote affordable housing. Uh, one other thing I might add, just uh, um, Representative Porter called me a little while ago. Uh, she regrets being able to be on with us today because she had uh, uh, an emergency that came up this morning and, and sends her apologies. Thank you. All right, Representative uh, D'Agostino. Just to, to piggyback on Marty's comments, I think, you know, as I was living in, what I thought of myself was what you really need is sort of that carrot and stick approach um, with respect to municipalities. Marty mentioned two of them, uh, and to me it's a reflection of sort of the Gordian knot issue that that that, uh, that hinders affordable housing in Connecticut, which are the local zoning rules, right? I mean, if you left it up to every municipality in every neighborhood, they'd probably say, oh, that's fine, just not here. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know how you cleave that knot, um, but but Marty's comments, I think, give you the, the right indication on how to do it, which is, you know, incentivize towns, let them, um, you know, those that want to do that, um, you know, give them the resources to do it, make sure they're able to do it, as you mentioned with wells and that sort of thing, being able to tie in a city sewer, but also um, easing, uh, for lack of a better word, local restrictions, um, where they might prevent uh, affordable housing, as Marty mentioned, like near, uh, near mass transit. That doesn't mean overruling and usurping local control uh, in all 
areas, but in certain at, at certain pressure points, I think we have to be willing as a state to say um, it, it, it can and should be allowed here. And we're going to get you to do it, but we're also going to say you can't prevent it uh, where it's necessary, like in those areas that we mentioned. So I think maybe a carrot stick approach is the best way to, to approach that thorny issue. Uh, Representative Elliott? Yeah, I don't have a lot more to add. This really isn't my uh, area of expertise, but I, I would say that this is going to probably require some funding from the state, some more significant funding that we've that we've given. I just know that over the course of the last four decades, we've uh, completely, not completely, we've just decimated HUD, uh, taking federal money away from this, uh, and it's never been refilled by states. Um, and so we used to take affordable housing very seriously, uh, and we've stopped doing so, and people need help. They can't afford these things on their own, and it's not going to happen simply by <clears throat> uh, incentivizing uh, developers through uh, just zoning regulations um, and, and trying to make things cheaper. I think we need to this is an issue where I do think you actually get somewhere by throwing money at the problem. Um, and un until we are willing to do that, I think we're just sort of dancing around the topic. Um, but that's really my only perspective on this. Representative Linehan. Hi, uh, I am really glad to be getting this question a, a little bit earlier in the process than the last one, because I do have something um, exciting to share. Um, we had heard from a couple of the colleagues that uh, being creative is, is really what's going to be most helpful. There is a bill that is currently in housing right now that is something so creative that no one's ever thought of, and, and I'm really hoping that it could work. Essentially, what it does is it allows seniors uh, to um, make their home deed restricted, which would be a... Um, you know, it, then it would be age restricted or income restricted, but a deed restricted home, <clears throat> excuse me, in exchange for 100% property tax reduction for seniors, so that when the senior then is, um, uh, when her their estate, you know, they're no longer alive, that that can only be sold as a deed restricted home, therefore uh, naturally integrating neighborhoods uh, and not having to do so by building new uh, stock housing. This is like within its current stock. Uh, additionally, because um, a lot of the arguments that we've heard is that deed restricted housing um, will bring down the values in the neighborhoods, which I don't necessarily agree with. Um, but it said, you know, there are a lot of people that do. This essentially makes um, the realtors might be happy because they say, well, then if we're looking at comps in the neighborhood, it's not an apples to apples comparison and you don't include those deed restricted homes in the comps. Um, and so while this may take some time to turn over, it is a way to keep open space to help seniors uh, and to really naturally integrate neighborhoods. Uh, and I think it has some really, really great potential. And so with that, um, you know, it, it's Representative Osborne. She is new to the legislature, which is really fantastic. And she has some very creative ideas. I'm interested to see how the public hearing uh, comes out on that. But it's really helpful to seniors, um, to municipalities, and to those who uh, would purchase these deed restricted homes. So I'm excited. Representative Willinger. I think that, oh, sorry, um, when we look at this problem, it is going to be a, a balanced and multi-pronged uh, approach to it. Um, we need to make sure that the programs that allow first-time homebuyers access to, to that kind of generational wealth building um, are funded, that they are staffed, um, and that people know about them. Um, and I think that we also need to work with our municipalities um, because, for example, in Orange, we have a fantastic new pro um, development that is being built, but it is being done in partnership, not only with the town, but with a developer who lives in our town. So it is affordable housing that is being, that took into consideration the importance and value of uh, community feedback and buy-in, um, and also is looking to address a very real concern because it's 
this isn't just for you know seniors that are having issues um, or people who want to uh, relocate to the state. It's also about our younger people who are not able to live in the, the towns that they grew up in. Um, we I talk about a lot that the fact that Connecticut has such an amazing educational system that we are basically investing in products in a way, if you think about it in a very um, detached way, we are investing in these products that we are then shipping off to other states. So we are not taking um, our investments back into our own communities because our kids can't afford to live here. Um, so looking at infrastructure supports, what we can do, um, how can we remove barriers to home buying and staying in our homes and um, and um, and then looking at community buying. Uh, it's it's going to be not uh, an easy process because there are so many different types of communities within the state. Um, but I think also really acknowledging how great that Connecticut is and how people do want to live here is a first step. We have to start being more positive about our state. So thank you. Okay. Uh, Representative Yakarina. Thank you. I apologize, Mary, first. I didn't, I, I wasn't saying there, it's talking to a customer. I agree quite a bit with Representative Wheeler just said, and it's really a difficult, you know, it's it's difficult because you have home rule, but we, I think Representative Chickarella Looney mentioned transit oriented. I think we really need to look more at that with the infrastructure. Uh, when you have a, I've always pushed for hubs for the sciences and, the, and engineering and, and the bioscience, but with those hubs, you need housing. And generally that's uh, in the more urban areas to outskirts of the suburb. It's a tough, where my shop is now, it was built right after World War II and it was all, but the country had so much land then and we don't have the land we used to have, but they were all military homes for the most part or, or affordable housing or affordable homes. Um, it's, it's really a, I don't have the answer to be honest. It's, I think we need to look at the cities or, orients, or transit oriented. I think that would help with, with job creation, but keeping our young kids here. And what, I like what the governor said about housing. I don't agree with, Forgivable, the forgivable, you know, the fifteen thousand dollars forgivable. I think people should pay that back just because it's just. I just think that's. I think it's the right thing to do. Even if it's that one percent, they should pay that money back. But I do like the governor's approach uh, for the most part the other day. But it's really getting towns to buy into it. And and our town North Haven, we did a, a, a NOAA North Haven affordable housing project about seven years ago. It worked out good. It was a small area, but we have no. We virtually have no land left in North Haven. And that's for a lot of town. So where do you find that? And it's generally going to be in the outskirts of the cities. We have New Haven is really becoming congested, but there's a lot of old factories that you can make apartments or houses. Uh, I used to work construction and we did in New Haven on Orange Street near Nikas Market, uh, an old, old 1850s house. We built uh, seven, uh, we were the sub, we built seven units in there. The problem with that is it was so expensive regular person can't they can't can't afford that so you need to be perfectly honest here i think we need to work with our towns uh labor is so expensive now um not just because of covid it's been expensive for a while so it's i wish i had the, i wish i had the, the answer it's, i think it's really looking at what, what works incrementally and working together not suing like many times builders sue which is it's it's it's, it's uh, all right senator cabrera Thank you. Um, very, very important topic. Um, I'm really excited and encouraged the governor uh, made it an important part of his budget address a couple of days ago. And I know that uh, House Majority Leader Rojas has also spoken out on this. I think um, there's lots of ways to do this. I think everyone acknowledges that we have a problem. Um, and really, if we are going to get serious about attracting businesses to the state of Connecticut and have them have a, a place to live, we've got to figure out how to crack this. Um, it's really about economic development. Um, I talk to companies all the time, I'm sure my colleagues do as well. <laughs> that is something that comes up often, um, where to put people. Um, we have a unique opportunity here with the Infrastructure Recovery Act, um, and a significant amount of money the state of has received around transit, uh, whether it's the Waterbury train line, um, in my district at Derby, we have a huge opportunity right off of Route 8 there in, in the train line where there's lots of property that's being uh, cleaned up and remediated 
really quite incredible housing uh, in downtowns like that um, around Connecticut. And we've, get, we've got to figure out a way uh, to do that. And I, I'm hopeful that we will. I also want to mention that in addition to making it easier for developers to build new homes and new apartments and new condos, we have to keep in mind that we have lots of people in the city of Connecticut who are having trouble just staying in their, in their mobile homes, staying in their condominiums and their townhouses. Um, I know myself and Senator Rooney and a few others, I believe, on, on here, uh, put in a bill to allow for fair rent commissions. Uh, we have a situation in Hamden where private equity, and this is happening across the country, are buying up large tranches of uh, property and in some cases doubling the rent. So I think it's also important for us to keep in mind that not only do we need more new housing, but we've got to fight to make sure that working class people and middle class people who are in these condominiums, these mobile homes, these apartment complexes, that in some cases are on fixed income, things coming from fossil, the price of inflation being so high last year, um, are struggling. And we're seeing evictions go way up. Lots of tenants are being um, uh, served with eviction notices. And we've got to keep that them in mind as well. We're going to you know, have a prosperous Connecticut. All right. Thank you all. Um, the next question is going to start with Senator Looney first, and it is, undergrounding of utilities is now recognized by FEMA as an important and legitimate use of tax dollars to improve resiliency um, to communities around the country suffering from hurricanes and other extreme weather conditions. It's all of us. Uh, would you support the creation of a governor's task force to create a plan for the undergrounding of utilities in Connecticut and a long-term plan for funding? If not, why not? And if so, what are the main issues that the task force should look at? Yes, thank, I certainly would create support creation of a gubernatorial task force uh, for that reason, because uh, the hardening of our infrastructure, I think, is uh, a critically important issue as uh, we see things are more volatile with increasing storms uh, and uh, concerns about uh, the impacts of, of climate change and uh, change in our weather patterns. Uh, of course, it is very expensive to place utilities underground. It also does add to the, uh, the repair costs sometimes because of the difficulty of getting at them uh, when they are underground, but uh, in terms of uh, avoiding uh, outages, that's uh, it's important. So I would uh, certainly support the creation of a task force to look at that to uh, to see whether it, it might be possible to uh, to mandate that uh, when new utilities are installed, uh, that they be uh, uh, underground to the extent that that could be managed, and uh, was that the cost of putting existing utilities underground would be just so astronomical. But it's certainly a, a problem that could be approached uh, incrementally. Uh, and I certainly would support a task force for that purpose uh, to evaluate uh, the speed at which it could be done uh, and the, uh, the, the cost that could be uh, absorbed over time to do it. Uh, Representative D'Agostino? Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I think I'd go even further. I certainly would support the task force, but I, I think we as a legislature should direct and task Bureau, the Public Utilities Regulatory Authority, to actually do this. This is this is something they should be looking at. And I've, I've always been a bit frustrated that they tend to be more reactionary than prospective. Um, and they really should be, we should be directing them to do this. They have the staff, they have the resources to do it. And most importantly, they have the ability to dive into the utilities um, uh, uh, finances to really get into the feasibility of this. Because we know what the utilities are going to say, right? They're going to say, well, it's going to cost $50 billion and all that's going to be put on the rate payers. And so it can't be done. And so instead, they're going to say, we'd like to spend a couple million dollars a month cutting down every tree in the state of Connecticut, um, which obviously I oppose. <laughs> so uh, I'd really like to see them as the regulatory body take this on. And I actually thank you for the suggestion. I hadn't thought about it from the perspective of sort of an overall um direction of, of a plan so I, I i i think i'm gonna work on with my colleagues here putting together some language to maybe direct bureau to actually do this okay representative elliot yeah this is something i looked at i don't know a few years ago because i was just curious about the economics of this and the economics of it are pretty terrible <laughs> i was really surprised because i really really wanted it to make sense to have everything be underground uh, especially given that I live in Northern Hampton and I'm losing power literally all the time uh, and it sucks. Uh, and so I, I did some research and it's, um, it's by an order of magnitude more expensive when you start going through the process of uh, 
putting utilities under, underground. Um, happy for there to be a task force. I'm happy to be shown that my uh, surface level uh, due diligence was incorrect and um, always happy to have more information. Representative Linehan. Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I absolutely support any task force that's looking into this. I just want to make sure that we're looking into the environmental impact. Um, what happens if um, there is something that needs to be fixed during a um, very rough winter and the ground is frozen? All of these things, I, you know, it's not something that I have um, done a really deep dive, but mm -hmm. I do know, um, especially, you know, representing um, Northern Hamden, and then even into Cheshire, we have had these issues um, with power reliability. Uh, and the question becomes, um, is the return on investment going to be appropriate and helpful? Uh, is the environmental impact going to be um, too much that we shouldn't take it on? Uh, and then finally, you know, what about the upkeep? Everyone says like, oh, well, it's, you know, they have them all down in North Carolina and South Carolina, and, and it seems to be fine, but we're different here. Um, and the ground can be very frozen. And so what happens then? Then is it almost like digging into concrete if something needs to happen? Does it um, slow a repair? All of these questions need to be answered in addition to the other questions that my colleagues had mentioned. Um, and the only way we get to the bottom of that is if we do a deep dive in studies. So I think we can't move forward with anything until we do that. So I absolutely believe that we should. Representative Willinger. Thank you. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add to my colleagues' really great suggestions and comments. Um, I think that we should be looking at a number of different ways that we can ensure um, that we have the best type of power delivery system that is uh, reliable. Um, so I would definitely support a task force, but I think that when we look at task force, we also have to have something on the back end that ensures that something is actually done. If they do find that the, the positives outweigh the negatives, um, then we can't just say, oh, that was a really great idea and then have it sort of float off into the ether. It actually has to have some sort of trigger that means that we have to get something done. Um, and whether that goes through Pura or the legislature, um, there has to be some accountability. And I do think that to um, emphasize what Robert D'Agostino said, we cannot continue just to cut down trees and say that is the only solution. Um, that is just creating a whole different other level of problems. I think we're going to start seeing erosion issues that are going to be coming up because the ground systems are not, the supports are not there anymore. Um, we're going to be looking at increased road temperatures because the shade canopies are gone, um, which will impact the neighborhoods that are, uh, that surround it because then your house will not have the shade and you're going to be using more energy for um, air conditioning. And it, it's, there's, we can't just look at one idea and say, well, there we go, that fixed it. So a task force is great, but also some, um, uh, some accountability on the back end for everyone. Thank you. Representative Yacarino. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think we definitely would have to look at some form of study, either then work with Pura, but it's going to be a combination of there's so many trees that, like everybody said, have been cut down. They're doing it on my street right, right now in Harford Trump. Like they've cut down so many trees. Um, so the UI and the Eversource utilities, have, and with the ratepayers, we've invested millions and hundreds of millions of dollars in taking out trees, but then we need to know, you know, we have to look going forward, we put lines on the ground with conduits, I, you know, we'd have to look at the study. And I think looking at a, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a study with some sort of consequences, some sort of plan, that's the way to go. And I, it's, it's a very, um, uh, we have an old system, but we need to look forward and maybe anything new being built, looking if it's feasible to put underground lines uh, for, for our power grid. Thank you. Okay, um, Senator Cabrera. Thank you. Um, it, I'm on the Energy and Technology Committee. This is something we've, we've been struggling with last fall session. I know my uh, colleague, Norm Needleman, who chairs the committee, has been very vocal uh, about this issue. 
Um, one thing he has been outspoken about which I support is making sure that lobbying fees and any kind of fees uh, that the utilities pay to lobby us um, not come out of, on the repair side. Um, and that's something that it, it really is it's a, it's a structural problem with the rate payers. I know in my district a couple of years ago, we lost a ton of power. Um, I definitely am in favor of a task force. Um, Sean, when we talked about perhaps uh, exploring, I think we've spoken about this, hardening the infrastructure, the grid in strategic spots where we know things go down. The unfortunate challenge with that is climate change getting worse, and we're seeing the severity and the negative impact of of storms uh, getting more and more severe uh, every year. Um, there's not a lot of quick answers to this. It's a very complicated thing. Um, but I think also we take steps to be able to figure out a way to tackle it and harden the grid is one thing. The cost can be an issue, as what Degasino mentioned, and we know what the line is going to be. Um, but we're the legislature, and we have the ability to, to, to do this if have the will to, to do it. Um, and uh, energy prices, I don't see them really coming down to a level that's sustainable for most people. It's just, and it's also effect, affecting our ability to attract and maintain businesses here. I think that's one piece that sometimes is uh, missing in the conversation. Uh, while we know that uh, homeowners are dealing with significant rate increases, uh, it's also affecting our small and mid-sized businesses in the state because um, they have large electricity and utility costs as, as well. So. Uh, I'm getting to the task force, and I think we need to stop and at this and keep fighting for it. Senator Chicarello. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's important that, you know, before making any decisions, you kind of study the the, the pros and cons and, and the best way to deliver, um, you know, or execute the plan. Um, I think having the utilities underground are a great idea. Um, you see a lot of, of new um, developments, you know, putting all of the utilities underground. Um, as far as servicing them goes, um, you know, when they're wire, um, really the junction boxes, if you will, where anything may go wrong are normally above ground. So everything's under the ground and then servicing it shouldn't be an issue in those cold winter months. Um, and I, I think it's a great idea. And then, it, you know, obviously reduces the amount of trees that we have to take down. And I think it's very important that we're paying attention to that. Um, but it is quite expensive, but we are at a unique point where there's some infrastructure money coming in and when we're breaking ground to do anything, let's think ahead, whether it's putting conduit in, um, if we're gonna be doing a lot of work, I think the plan needs to be uh, talked about sooner than later as we have a lot of this money coming in. And I know that there's a lot of talk with fiber coming in um, that we really plan and not do things twice, kind of a simple you know, philosophy, work smarter, not harder. And, and I think that we should explore our options sooner than later um, and start really considering getting our, our utilities underground uh, in a, the most cost efficient way. And when we're doing one thing, um, you know, plan for the next uh, would be a, a good idea. Um, and, and everyone else kind of went into greater detail. So we'll just wait for the next question. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Um, next question is going to start uh, with Representative D'Agostino, and it is as follows. Connecticut is looking at a revenue surplus this year. Um, how do you propose to use this year's surplus? Um, and it's followed by a second part. Um, the governor is proposing tax reform measures to ease the burden on middle income and lower income households and better equalize the tax burden between middle income and wealthy households. What reform measures do you see as most promising for the legislature to consider this session and if Connecticut raises taxes on wealthy people, will they move out of the state? <laughs> All right, Representative. A loaded Thomas. question. Um, yeah, but, very but loaded. Obviously, but obviously all, all related. Um, so look, when, when I came to the legislature, we were facing literally billion dollar deficits. Uh, uh, and so this has been quite, quite the change. And it is a result of some of the fiscal restraints that we put in. Uh, Josh was preaching about this years ago when he got elected was to get away from the up and down revenues of of individual um, income taxes and it, it's all helped. So, look, um, there's a lot of different competing proposals about there about how to spend the money. I, I would I would like to see more devoted to increasing school aid, the the ECS aid. 
um, that's not just because I have a bias as a former Board of Education member in Hamden, but it's because I do think it actually helps answer the second part of your question, which is, keep in mind, the strain on our school systems ends up being a strain on the entire community. Um, and that leads to increased property taxes uh, just about everywhere you go. And so when you actually prevent an overload on the school system side, you help reduce the increase in municipal taxes, which is the largest chunk of, of what people actually pay in the state of Connecticut. And it's the most unfair part, the property taxes, the municipal taxes, because, I mean, there's breaks on the income tax side, but everybody has to pay that property tax. Even if you're a renter, you're stuck with that because of the rent you're paying. It's, it's, it's washed through that. So I'd like to see us put more into ECS. There's a proposal out there to do that. It's more than what the governor has said. Um, it, it will take a little bit away from what's proposed in other areas. I still think you can balance that up with some uh, of what he's proposing in terms of reducing the tax burden on lower uh, income folks in, in our progressive tax system. But that's where I'd like to see more of the surplus, if you will, go. I don't want to see us, however, uh, and I'm glad we just voted this week to keep in place the fiscal guardrails that have really led to us having this surplus. I would not jettison all of that uh, because I think that's just going to lead us down the road to where we were when I came in with um, with billions of dollars. Uh, as far as do people move out or not, I'm going to def let Josh answer that question because I know he's actually collected a lot of data on the fact that, that people don't tend to leave. Um, I will just put this little asterisk on, on that last part of your question. I don't think just simply ta t increasing taxes on the wealthy in, in, in the ether is makes sense. Well, the, wealthy, the really wealthy don't pay taxes. They, they don't. They, they don't pay income taxes. They, they've got their money uh, you know, put away in, 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 in what, um, mechanisms that avoid taxes. Warren Buffett famously pays less in taxes as a percentage of income than his assistant does. He says that all the time. So when you talk about increasing taxes on the wealthy, which I support, you, you can't just say increasing the income tax. You've got to focus that on capital gains, on maybe, uh, I love the idea Marty, I think, came up with a while back. Marty, correct me if I'm speaking for you incorrectly, but the idea of a kind of wealth tax on property over a certain amount, because that's really what makes the most sense, not just simply increasing income taxes. Representative Elliott. So I'm going to talk about the tax cut first that Ned um, implied that he would like to see. I don't have a problem with the tax cut aimed at where uh, he's he's placing it. Uh, what I do have a problem is blowing a, a $400 million hole in the budget um, for future legislatures and governors. So uh, I'd be fine with this tax cut if it's also coupled with uh, more progressivity on the upper end. Uh, one of the bills that I have in is indexing uh, the marginal tax brackets to inflation uh, to combat bracket creep, whereby your uh, buying power may not actually increase year over year, even if you're getting 2% increases, uh, and yet you end up in, in higher tax brackets. Um, but we're still percentage points below uh, on the ta top tax rate of 6.99% compared to New Jersey and New York. So there, there's still plenty of room uh, to go and still be competitive with, with nearby states. Um, this is not an issue that's going to come up seriously, the issue of taxing the wealthy in our state for the next four years. Uh, we have a wealthy governor from uh, Greenwich who sees this as punishing success, uh, something I vehemently disagree with uh, at a fundamental level. Um, there are a number of us that believe that there are big problems to their tax structure. Uh, every two years, we're supposed to be putting out a report on uh, how much each income decile, uh, among other data, uh, how people pay as a percentage of their income to state and local taxes, um, we have not moved the needle in the last 10 years. Uh, in 2014, we ran a study. Last year, two years ago, we ran a study. Uh, and the problem has only uh, become worsened. So uh, it's going to take people both in the legislature and the executive branch to, to see this as a, a real problem, not just in terms of fairness, but in terms of protecting democracy uh, and viewing it through that lens. Lastly, I, I will say that in terms of the issue of people moving out, there is a, a, a rich data set uh, showing over the course of decades 
uh, that people are, uh, their decisions to move are not dictated uh, by tax policy in that state. Uh, they're dictated by a whole host of issues that I, are not necessarily important to go into now. Uh, but the short answer to, to your question is no, that people don't move as a result of, of that tax policy. Uh, the fact is that we are in the position as legislators or the governor uh, to be talking with people who will make those threats uh, idle threats. And uh, you're going to be constantly hearing that. But looking writ large, um, this is not something that that incentivizes or, or de-incentivizes people from moving in or out of a state. Representative Linehan. Yes, thank you so much. Um, you know, it's not that I disagree with the policy because uh, I think that it's important to utilize this money for some tax cuts. I think that my question and my concern is really based around um, the definitions that talk about where these tax cuts are going. So um, I think the definition of middle class is a bit different than um, what we talk about normally here in Connecticut. Um, and I'm sorry, my dog agrees with me apparently. Um, one of the things um, that I think we need to start utilizing more is uh, the ALICE acronym, which is Asset Limited Income Constrained um, and Employed. And these are the people that look like they may make a lot of money on paper, but it's they're still paycheck to paycheck. Um, the cost of living in Connecticut uh, and in the Northeast, it's not just Connecticut, let's be honest, um, you know, is different than if we're just use, using certain multipliers of federal poverty levels. It doesn't really work out and it doesn't tell the whole story. So I would like to see um, whether it be more tax cuts to the Alice families or whether it be um, more help for Alice families and that, that doesn't need to be um, in the tax cut realm. Um, you know, I hear from families that I represent that are having a hard time putting oil um, in their tanks. And these are people who are consistently far above um, the income threshold for some help. And so I think it's about the definitions of who the middle class are. Um, and I would like to see more programs that would allow Alice families to tap into some of this money um, to help them get through this period. And then essentially we're not creating that hole in the budget. We're not um, really hamstring, hamstringing ourselves for um, years in the future. Instead, we're looking at getting over the hump right now, and then we can do a little bit more of a dig to see um, where we need to adjust tax cuts in the future. So I think that there needs to be an additional conversation over that. Um, but one thing I will say that uh, I am very disappointed in is there hasn't been enough talk about reinstituting the child tax credit. And I think that's very important. We did a great job of um, uh, working for seniors regarding um, uh, the income tax on retirement income. I think that was huge. Um, and for every door that I knocked and I told them about that, they were very excited. So now let's look at, okay, what does it mean to be middle-class in the state of Connecticut? What does it mean to be an Alice family? And adjust um, whether it be economical help on that end or um, whether it be tax cuts for those Alice families and not just a certain multiplier. So thank you. Okay. Representative Hollander. Uh, thank you. When we're looking at the surplus, it, it's, I don't want to think about it as a bonus payment right now. I'm looking at what can we do with this as a long-term return on investment? How can we invest in uh, some of the very systemic issues that we have that will actually create long-term change within the state rather than just a, a band-aid um, right now. And I honestly, I don't know the right answer to that. I think that we could look at a number of different things. We could look at um, some of the the suggestions that the, the governor had about um, affordable housing or different, um, you know, budgetary or tax breaks for different groups. But I think if you know when we look at, I think he mentioned if you make over one hundred and fifty or under one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, you'd get five hundred dollars back for the year, which I'm not going to sneeze at. You know that's, but when we look at the definition of middle class, when we look at um, what a number of, of of people in our state are dealing with with uh, student loan debt, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in Connecticut 
doesn't carry the same as $150,000 in Kentucky. So uh, it, it's such a big picture concern. And I think about you know, what Rep. D'Agostino said as another former Board of Education member, um, ECS funding is a huge way that we can, um, you know, lift all boats type of situation. But when we do that, we also have to look at special education funding because there are a number of um, towns and districts that are seen as overfunded, but are actually carrying a higher percentage of um, children who need special services, which has a much higher cost than um, educating a neurotypical student. Um, but that's part of a federal issue as well as a state issue. Um, but it does pass along that burden to residents. And when we I then, if we're going to look at that, then we also need to look at child care support so people can go to work if they want to. Um, if we have birth to three, we should actually be looking at birth to five. So we don't have that gap um, for children who may need a little bit of support before they get to elementary school. There's so many different ways that we can um, use this money. And so I'm not entirely sure what the best pathway is. I think we're going to have a lot of really in-depth discussions and we're going to have to make some really hard decisions about, you know, and it's not going to be invalidating one choice over another, but we do have to look at the long-term investments um, for the betterment of all of our communities. Okay. Representative Yaccarino. Hi. The first part of the question was if folks leave or the state for the income tax. I think some folks leave. I think some folks come, come to Connecticut. It's hard to, um, you know, I'll hear people that I left because of the income tax and I hear people come here because of the sciences or, or, or certain jobs. So I don't know the, for a fact what happens. I think our state uh, has done well over, over the last few years. And it goes back to the 2017 bipartisan budget that really worked. Uh, as far as um, the governor's budget proposal, overall, I think I really like most of it. Um, I like that he's putting more money into uh, early child education. Not a lot, but some um, helping um, the earning income tax. A lot of times people feel, well, that's Republicans that might not think that, but I think that actually helps a lot of our lower middle class folks under 60, I think it's under $60,000. Uh, and the incremental um, income tax deduction for 100,000 or less, I think that helps a lot of people. Uh, as far as education dollars, we, we definitely need some more education dollars. And that's what we're gonna have to debate as a legislature. But then homeless, the homeless population, the, the organization, they need a lot more money that, that's in the budget. Um, so we're going to have that debate. Uh, but I think we have to, we all want something, but we have to see how we're going to pay for it and continue to grow our economy to help people. Um, in the budget, there's money for, for like I said earlier, about the home, for, home for, for, for people to have first time home buyers. There's a lot of good things in it. And I think we need to work both, uh, you know, finance and appropriation committees and all of us on how do we fund it, whatever, as much as we possibly can. But I think it's a good start. And I think we have to stay within the guardrails and I'm, I'm, I'm glad of that, I'm happy for that. But um, we'll have that debate between now and, um, well, hopefully well before June, hopefully by uh, March or April. Thank you. Okay. Senator Cabrera. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's important to um, kind of frame this topic in a way that does justice to the folks who are cashing help every single day. And I'm glad that Representative Linehan mentioned uh, the Alice um, metric needs to choose somebody right away. And just so we're aware, and I'm, I know my colleagues are aware, but it's really, it's home hard for me. Um, that report showed that in Connecticut, a family of four um, with two young children to survive a survival budget would have to make $90,000 a year. Ninety to survive and um, many of my colleagues here have uh, said things uh, about people they meet and I think sometimes when we have this conversation we oftentimes in our head have images of um, really really poor or working poor or lower middle class folks and that is true but what we have in Connecticut is we have people who on the outside on the surface may seem like solidly middle class who are also struggling with the cost of energy with the cost of food with inflation. Um, and that's a really important thing to remember because this is this tax injustice because of our tax code is impacting all levels of income 
and our middle class, especially uh, even even people who with higher incomes in Connecticut. And those are the people that are leaving. Um, Josh is 100 correct. It's not the really super wealthy who are leaving. They have options. We're losing our working and middle class folks, people who we know would spend their disposable income to further uh, create more economic activity. Who are going to go out to a restaurant? Who are going to go out to take their kids out to um, a movie? Um, who are going to go out and help create the kind of economic activity we always say we want in Connecticut. And for me, it's an issue of fairness. I'm really concerned, and I know some of my colleagues share this concern, because the largesse we're all enjoying now, the surpluses, the, 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 the rainy day fund, the, the paying down the pension, which are all fantastic and are great. Well, let's be honest. This is in large part because of the response to the pandemic, which was appropriate, and because of the largesse we've gotten from Washington, which is very appropriate, needed, happened all over the country, and, I, and I, 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 I'm glad we did that. But we have yet to seriously tackle the underlying tax structures in the state of Connecticut. And I'm for the tax that the governor proposed uh, this past week. I'm in favor of that. But we have a prime opportunity here to change the structure of how we generate revenue and how we uh, dole out uh, revenue in the state of Connecticut to target middle class folks, target working class folks, and to create real economic development because the reality is that the money we got to the CARES Act, the Recovery Act, it's gonna run through the system, so to speak. And then it's gonna be gone. And I'm praying and hoping we don't have um, hard economic times, but economic history being what it is, we're going to, at some point, reach a moment where these funds are gonna be depleted. We're gonna have clips on a lot of these programs um, that we're also happy to have funded. And then what? we're probably going to do what we've always done respectfully. And that is hurt the very people we say we want to fight for. And that's our nonprofits who do a lot of yeoman's work in, in doing providing services for our disabled, for our needy, for our elderly, all across the state. Back to the fights we had in 2016 and 2015 and 2017, far long before I was here. Um, and I don't I mean those are tough times. But we've got to tackle the real structure. And Josh is 100% correct. We've got to start thinking about wealth, not just income. Representative Dagasina talked about this earlier. We've got to talk, talk about inherited wealth and how that's taxed. And then also uh, private equity and also the big companies like Facebook and Google. And I know some of this stuff is happening and will be debated at the federal level, but we can do our part here in Connecticut uh, as well. And Josh talked about it. This is a threat to our democracy. Um, if the last four years, has taught us anything is what can happen when a demagogue rises and speaks to the fears of working and middle class people and finds people to blame uh, for their economic plight in life. Um, that's dangerous. And we can do our part here to really change the structure in Connecticut and how we do business, how we support our schools, all the things that have been talked about here today. And I get really concerned that I, about my own story. You know, I, I'm, I'm a son of an immigrant. We came to this country with no education, barely speaking uh, English, and there were guard, there were on ramps for me, whether it was Pell Grants or FHA loans or after school programs or college readiness programs. I don't see that reality anymore for too many young people in the state of Connecticut. And we've been blessed in that we've had this large tranche of money come in from the feds, but but we've got to prepare for the future. And if we're serious about uh, giving everyone in the state a chance to get into the middle class and stay there. And not be, uh, you know, up to their, up to their head, uh, treading water. Um, we need to really tackle the underlying structures. So, thanks. Thank you, Senator Looney. Yes, thank you. I, I certainly support the governor's proposal to make the state income tax uh, more progressive <clears throat> by reducing the uh, the rate at the lower end, uh, reducing the 3% rate to 2, the 5% rate to 4, because it's been a struggle for now more than 30 years uh, to make the income tax more progressive since it was first enacted as a flat rate 4.5% tax back in 1991, uh, at which point that was the only one the votes were there to pass. Uh, in the state Senate because Senator Nickerson from Greenwich recognized that proposal would actually create a windfall for his constituents, uh, most of whom had income that was already taxed at a higher rate. People forget we had a partial income tax at that time, a tax on, on, in, on dividends, income, and capital gains, which was substantially higher. So most of his constituents actually got a tax reduction when the flat rate 4.5% applying to all income uh, was passed. So we've been looking to, uh, to uh, modify that ever since and have built in uh, incremental progressivity. Uh, however, I think, uh, I think Representative Elliott pointed out uh, the governor's proposal is uh, more expensive than it needs to be uh, because 
uh, the relief should be targeted only to, to those in the lower income brackets because everyone in Connecticut right now, except those uh, in the two highest brackets, pay a blended income tax rate. Uh, so that you have a certain amount on a portion of income, a higher amount on the next portion. So some quite wealthy people under the governor's proposal would get at least a small uh, benefit, which I think is really unnecessary <clears throat> because uh, uh, I think that uh, there was one statistic that said those making uh, $250,000 a year would still get $500 and those making over half a million a year would still get $200. So I don't think we need to have that in the proposal at all. Uh, and focus the uh, relief exclusively on those whose income is within uh, the lower brackets. Um, that is, uh, we also uh, need, I think, uh, over time uh, to look at this, that uh, any income tax change should be revenue neutral, which is why ideally it should be accompanied by uh, some increase at the, at the higher end. And that would really build in more progressivity because uh, right now our highest rate is still a relatively low rate compared to, to neighboring states. There's nothing about our income tax that is in any way punitive. There's nothing that's a disincentive for people to leave uh, because uh, the states in our region all have as high or higher rates. And uh, I think that we need to have a separate tax on uh, on capital gains of an incremental amount above the, uh, the level we are now because uh, we had a study that uh, pointed out that uh, uh, the higher you go in income, uh, the higher percentage of your income comes from capital gains and dividends uh, and not from earned income. Our, an OFA study pointed out that for people who earn less than $100,000 a year, more than 90% of their income tax is paid through their through their withholding, whether they're paid weekly or biweekly or monthly. Once you get to a level of, uh, of $2 million a year, that rarefied level, less than 20% of the income of those people uh, is earned income and the rest of it is investment income. So a typical, if there is such a thing as a typical person making uh, 2 million a year, approximately 400,000 of that may come in earned income and 1.6 million uh, is from uh, dividend income. Uh, the other thing, of course, uh, as was pointed out, is that uh, the wealthiest people in effect decide how much income they're gonna have in a given year based on their decisions as to whether to take a capital gain in a given year or take a capital loss in addition to the other privileges and powers and discretion they have, basically framing their income uh, to, to suit what they want in a given year uh, is another power they have. And uh, that's why uh, I think we need to look at, uh, at taxing assets uh, at the higher end as well, because that's a tax that can't be uh, avoided. That's why I have a proposal that would institute a statewide uh, property tax of one mil uh, on properties that have an assessed value of more than one and a half million and two mils on those that have pro values of above two million. Uh, at least because uh, uh, wealthy people have very creative ways of shielding income from the income tax. But if you own a property, it's there, it's on the tax rolls um, and, uh, and can be taxed without evasion. So uh, while I applaud the governor's uh, proposal to make the state income tax uh, more progressive by providing relief at the lower end, uh, I think it needs to be shaped in a way uh, that doesn't provide uh, 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 an unneeded tax cut uh, to those at the higher end. So I would think that for those who are in the incremental brackets um, that uh, uh, are still play, paying a blended rate, uh, that should be cut off at a, at, a, at a much lower figure so that the proposal he's making would be less expensive than it is now because uh, we are gonna need income tax revenue. And the important thing to realize is that the tax that people find burdensome in Connecticut is not any tax levied directly by the state. It is the property tax. And the reason for that is in effect, we haven't raised enough money through the income tax and other state taxes over the years to provide enough revenue to municipalities to offset that high property tax. So the reality is we need to focus on property tax relief and, uh, and tax equity because uh, the income tax in and of itself is not in any way a punitive tax. All right, I wanna thank you all. And this is going to be the last question. Um, everybody will have approximately two minutes. Um, it's going to start with uh, Representative Elliott, and it is as follows. What are your top priorities for this session? I have a few. Um, so some voting related issues, um, working on ranked choice voting. Um, it's going to be tough to implement that with our infrastructure as it currently is. Um, so whether or not it's going to be a task force, a study, or going to be uh, allowing municipalities to use ranked choice, um, some of this is um, a, a prerequisite for ranked choice is going to be new tabulators, uh, which will cost the state around $25 million because we're not going to simply uh, force towns to, to spend this money. I, I think that 
that that would not work. So um, whether or not the governor agrees to be putting this money behind this effort is to be seen. Um, but any sort of future election administration uh, is going to rely on this infrastructure. So uh, hopefully we can convince them of that. Uh, I'm working on voting rights for people who are incarcerated, uh, Maine and Vermont never stripped these rights away about 60 years ago when states started doing so. And the question really is, do you believe that voting is a right or a privilege? I believe that it is a right. Uh, therefore, if you are uh, a resident in any way uh, or a constituent in any way in the US that you uh, should never have this right stripped. Um, as as D'Agostino said, when I first came in, talked a lot about tax equity, uh, hard to do in this environment with this governor, um, but gratified by the fact that we have a president of the Senate who believes very strongly in this issue as well. So I know that we have support upstairs and uh, we'll continue fighting for more fairness in our tax code. And um, those are some of the big ones. I'm, I'm working on still aid in dying. We got this out of committee last cycle for the first time in public health. Um, although I, I heard it, it had come out of aging about a decade ago. So I, I, I sort of need to revisit this stat. Um, the question is whether or not it can get through judiciary. So uh, I know a number of my colleagues on this uh, Zoom are, are with me on this issue. So we'll still be fighting for that and uh, working on the decriminalization of psilocybin or magic mushrooms. Uh, I had passed a task force last year or worked on passing a task force last year that looked at the medical framework. Researchers are very excited about the future of psilocybin, uh, yet they are unwilling to become truly political, uh, given what we saw about 50 years ago uh, when researchers sort of got ahead of their skis on this issue. So uh, there's a lot of really exciting developments there, but at the very least we can move forward on decriminalization uh, because I personally believe in decriminalization of uh, all illicit drugs. And I think if we're going to tackle anything, we'd be tackling the underlying issue of addiction uh, and, and the way that we treat mental health. So that is a nice little snapshot. And that's what I got for you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Linehan. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I I think my overall uh, priority is going to be reducing the economic burden on those Alice families. I think that's always uh, going to be extremely important. Um, and again, that comes back down to redefining exactly what the middle class is. And I think that we can find ways to do that without actually taking away um, needed funding um, from uh, lower economic individuals and families. So I think that there's a way to do this and I'm, and I'm committed to finding that. Uh, additionally, I am the chair of the, the co-chair of the committee on children. And so together with my co-chair, we're really working on a few different things surrounding kids. Uh, the first is we're going to continue to build upon the success of our, um, children's mental health bills from last year. And that is going to remain a priority. I, I can't say this enough that mental health is not something you do uh, one time and then it's going to fix the problem. Uh, it, there is always going to be something that we need to do. Uh, this year we are focusing um, on eating disorders. Uh, that's um, an area that we haven't really focused on um, it, by singling it out. I think that um, eating disorders uh, uh, are really rampant right now, especially, believe it or not, amongst boys. Uh, and we've seen those numbers climb through the roof. So we're really working on that. Um, and a lot of that has to do with training of individuals. Um, words matter. I, I mean, it comes really down to that a lot. Words matter. And that also um, it extends to my focus on supporting our LGBTQ youth. Uh, um, so that's going to be a really big part of of what we're doing in the Children's Committee. And additionally, uh, we're going to make sure that local school districts are guaranteeing federal Title IX protections uh, for children and families um, and working to really end the adult sexual misconduct in schools. Unfortunately, there have been uh, numerous um, school districts within the state of Connecticut that either employed uh, teachers who um, had um, either said things they shouldn't have been saying or even going all the way to um, 
true sexual misconduct. So we need to make sure that there's an understanding of the law and that we support our schools uh, in order to ensure that this doesn't happen. Um, and that, again, will also include supporting our LGBTQ children and families because uh, I cannot say this enough, simply being LGBTQ and supporting them in schools does not mean that schools are a place of grooming. Um, and we hear that all the time. It is absolutely not true. And I will uh, fight to the end to ensure that kids and families can be themselves without fear in the state of Connecticut. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Wellinger. Thank you. Um, so, I think I, I a lot of the things uh, that Representative Linehan mentioned, I also have been focusing on um, the eating disorder um, situation uh, in schools, um, building upon the the work that she and I were, I was her vice chair in children last term, um, and the children's mental health bill, uh, I, one of the things I'm working on is expanding the uh, licensing process for social workers so we can ensure that we have the uh, the personnel and the providers that are needed um, to uh, to ser serve our communities. Um, some of the other things that I, I'm continuing to work on is um, a bill that came out of the, the House uh, unanimously last session, but unfortunately was not called in the Senate. So I'm hoping that will change, but that would be looking at um, providing a protection system for um, uh, children who are uh, abused or exploited by online predators. Um, this is something that is happening more and more often. Um, it is happening to both boys and girls, and it is having lifelong horrific effects on our kids. So hoping we can get that through um, both chambers and up to the governor's office. Um, one of the other things I've been uh, working on is protections for kids who are witnessing um, domestic violence and domestic violence victims, um, whether or not that is um, automatic charges, if it is uh, something or an escalation of charges, if domestic violence um, or abuse happens in front of a minor. Um, so looking at that, safe streets uh, concerns, people are driving way too fast. Um, we have unfortunately lost our colleague, um, Representative Williams. Um, and so supporting any effort I can do with that, but also for pedestrian and cyclist and rider safety, um, what can we do um, to ensure that people can drive and walk and 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 are you know safe as much as possible um i have my list in front of me i don't think anyone needs to hear the entire list uh but i i know that a lot of us are on the same page when it comes to priorities um the one thing that i didn't propose but i am very much focused on is um, ECS funding and not just ensuring that our schools are all properly funded, but there there are uh, parameters in place to make sure that there are levels of accountability when it comes to um, our neighborhood public schools, um, charter school funding, um, and VOAG, VOTEC, and magnet school funding. Um, there's... Uh, okay, I'm afraid that's pretty much... That's that's it. <laughs> okay. Um, Representative Yacarino. Thanks. Uh, what was the question about uh, the priorities? Because I was taking care of some of these. Uh, my priority, you know, obviously, for the last six or seven years is to grow our science community and bioscience and STEM. And all, the reason I always say this is because I think that's one of our greatest strengths in Connecticut and could be even greater. And with that, it creates many, many jobs, delivers better health care. Um, not just in the science and the tech, but also people that have to build facilities, maintain facilities, uh, all the trades. So continue, continue work on that. I put some legislation in to try to grow further, but also uh, for screening for newborns. Um, there's unfortunately there's um, there's always pushback from the insurance industry about certain screenings, and I think um, I'm getting pushback already uh, from both sides actually, uh, and I think it's a mistake because those tests are vitally important. Um, to save lives and, and have a better life. And it may be some money up front, but in the long run, I think it saves a lot of money. So that's, those have been my priorities. Obviously, safe streets. I walk a lot and I've never, I just commission, uh, was commission, uh, excuse me, Penner Looney, we are on exec noms. And I asked Commissioner Ravello, the, uh, what, you know, this, we, I've never seen it so dangerous to walk or drive. It's just, 
you know, we 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 need our law enforcement, our, our fleet people in general, to be a little more careful. A lot of walkers out there, a lot of people that ride their bicycles. I won't even ride my bicycle any longer because people drive like uh, they don't care, and I don't know what it is. But really, the science's job, obviously, working with both sides to have a better budget in our in our state that helps a lot of our, our, our all of our residents and education, of course. Um, we all care. I think we most care about the same things. How do we get there? Um, of course, our seniors and I know that there was a housing question earlier, but people forget there's a lot of seniors that could really make it. And uh, how do we, you know, we need to work together for that. But in working for, of course, my, you know, Canadian folks. So thank you for hosting this. I really have to go go back to work. Um, I'm sorry, but I would thank everybody. That's fine. We That's all need fine. to work together. We, I think we all feel the same way. Okay. Thank Senator you. Cabrera. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much to the league for doing this and getting this all together on Saturday morning. Um, my overarching frame on everything is whether we're getting more folks into the middle class and whether we're actually trying to tackle a structural change. Um, a few things fall into that. For me, uh, one is a child tax credit, which there's a, I have a bill on, which I think is, uh, is proven to pull a lot of children out of poverty. Um, I'm hopeful we can get that out of finance committee and get it uh, onto the floor. Um, education funding is always an issue, which Representative Gristino, Representative Willen have talked about. Making that more equitable is really critical. And in making sure um, that we are giving more people opportunities, whether it's on the mental health front, other fronts, making sure we're getting the funding. Um, there's something out there um, that will probably come up in the legislature and that uh, we voted in last time, uh, and that's dating bonds. And that is something I'm hoping we'll be able to tackle. Again, um, we passed it in the legislature. It was an implementer. Um, we have some work to do with the governor's office to actually move on it. But if we're going to get serious about uh, really tackling the structural changes, this is one issue that I know the treasurer is focused on is baby bonds. And that allows uh, low income families to have uh, some money early on in life that they can use to go to school, start a business, um, you know, buy their first home. Um, that's the kind of real structural change that we should be championing and fighting for to making sure that uh, people have access to wealth and really are able to generate generational wealth. And so I'm hoping we can have a robust debate on that and uh, get that done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Looney. Well, thank you. And thanks to the league for setting this up. It's a tradition every year and it's one that I think we uh, we welcome. Uh, uh, one of the uh, the priorities that I have uh, has been working on for a number of years now, and um, started working on this with uh, Senator Fasano when he was the Republican leader, is 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 uh, pro consumer protection, healthcare reform, uh, and uh, reform of insurance industry practices, uh, which are uh, very often anti-patient, anti-consumer. So one of the the things I'm working on is uh, on the issue of prior authorization, which we know in many cases is uh, very problematic for doctors and patients having to seek prior author authorization uh, for treatment, which is uh, medically necessary. Uh, and it related to that is the issue of step therapy. There are times when insurance companies will require expensive step therapy, require people to go through treatments, which the treating physician believes will not be beneficial and uh, waste time before they get to the one that the physician knows will in fact be beneficial. And uh, there was a, a recent article uh, in the Washington Post from a, a journalist who, uh, who actually went through that with her own son, uh, talked about the delay in treatment that, uh, that he received because of the step therapy requirements. So uh, those two elements are important. Uh, also, I think we, uh, we need to look at, uh, uh, at prescription drug costs. Once again, that's another area uh, where we need to, to seek reform um, and protection. Uh, in addition to that, as was mentioned earlier, I think we need to build upon what we did last year in terms of children's mental health, uh, provision of quality preschool uh, and daycare pro uh, programs because too many children come to school unprepared to be in, in kindergarten and are developmentally far behind and sometimes never catch up. And they're the ones who often uh, uh, become truant and then become disciplinary problems and wind up in the uh, juvenile court a few years thereafter. So we need to continue to address that as we be, uh, began to do last year. Uh, of course, uh, supportive of, of uh, more funding for uh, ECS, which is all, all of a piece of this with uh, preparing our children, also uh, more support for, uh, for higher education as well. Uh, so I think those are, uh, are some of the priority issues uh, as well as those mentioned by others. Uh, so we will be engaged uh, for the next 17 weeks in doing all of this. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And last but not least, Representative D'Agostino. Thank you for letting me close out. And again, echoing, echoing what Mark Marty said, thanks again for putting this together. I look forward to it, to it every year. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to updating the privacy online privacy law that we passed last year. Uh, I was excited to see President Biden mention that in State of the Union on the federal level. I think it actually led on that last year. We've got 
a, a bill, a law that's more robust than the federal law, and I'd like to see it expanded this year. So we're working on updates to uh, have even more robust protections, for example, for the collection of data, your data online, and particularly uh, with respect to children online, and some of the predatory practices from from the, the data companies on that. So that's uh, something I'm working on. And then, uh, I mean, in addition to everything else everybody's mentioned, I, I want to just say, obviously, I'm, I'm I'm proud to be the Hamden, Hamden representative. Uh, so my focus is is often local as well in terms of priorities. And, and one of one of mine this year, I know the delegation shares is um, uh, trying to get uh, several million dollars in bonding for the town for the revitalization of um, the old middle school site in in Southern Hamden. Those of you from the area know that that building was abandoned 20 plus years ago. It's dilapidated, it's falling down, it's an eyesore. Uh, the mayor has come up with a, a wonderful vision for a community center in Southern Hamden, an, an area that's underserved and frankly ignored by prior administrations. Uh, and, and she's got a, a plan in conjunction with the community to raise the building and, and really make that area a, a hub for not only community, but also economic development. So it's a it's a huge priority of, of mine. And I, I hope the delegation shares it as well to to help us uh, get the bonding uh, for that part of Hamden that's been traditionally underserved and, and get that that building uh, taken down and a new community center built in the All right, at this point, I want to thank all of the panelists very much um, and turn it back over to Judy Lehman for any final comments that the league would like to make. Thank you all. Thank you, thank Jean. You. Okay, thank you, Jean. Thank you, Jean, and thank you. Um, to our, both our elected representatives and to the voters and prospective voters who chose to spend part of your Saturday with us. Um, I'm just so honored that, that you did spend as much time with us, uh, particularly you, you legislators, because um, we have almost the same number of people um, online with us now as we did when we began and that to me says a lot about the quality of the conversation that you all were having and i would give some credit to the uh, league members who d developed the questions and to our wonderful moderator who kept the flow going um, we missed you uh, representative porter but it was wonderful to have two new representatives with us, uh, Representative Wellander and, and Linehan. Um, and a special thanks to Cole Tucker Walton from the League of Women Voters of Reading, who has provided wonderful technical assistance to us throughout. So farewell, we'll see you again here, we hope uh, real soon and uh, have a wonderful Saturday, the rest of your Saturday. Bye. Thank you.